Hi, my name is Elke van Halmond and I'm a lecturer in criminology at the University of Kent. So what I've been doing over the past eight years is doing research about gangs and more specifically Congolese gangs in Brussels. And um, the theoretical question was, what is the seduction of gangs? So the topic of today is the pains and pleasures of doing that research, of doing an ethnographic research about gangs. But first, a short introduction of, about what I have been doing. So my research was about the seductions of gangs, which means that I was looking into the attractiveness of gang life, not really the reasons why young people would join a gang, but just what is so attractive about gang? Why would you feel cool when you're in a gang? Why wouldn't you just join the Boy Scout? So that was the main point of my research. And um, to do that, I had to have a case study. And in Belgium at that point, we had really some very violent issues with gang members in Brussels, and more specifically Congolese gang members. But because the Congolese community is such a closed community, we didn't have really any information or any data to start from. So when you're in that situation as a researcher, what you do, and certainly me with an anthropological background, is you start an ethnography, which means that you're going to do participant observation, which means that you are going to hang out with gang members. And I've been quite successful in doing that. So I hang out with gang members for one and a half year, join them going out, join them on several adventures. If you want to know more specifically about that, there is a course about how to do ethnography. Um, but what I want to talk about today is a question I get the most whenever I'm talking about my research. How did you do that? How did you, as a young white female, go and hang around with about 30, 40 black Congolese guys? So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So as you can see, this is a picture um, of me with some of the gang members uh, on a weekend when we're going to talk about non-violent communication. And as you can see, I'm quite visible the entire time. So normally what you would do as an ethnographer is you would wallflower a certain time. But my entire position made that quite impossible. I was just unable to be not seen whenever I was there. So um, then the entire question is again, like, how do you come, or how do you make them trust you? How do you become invisible? Because of course we have an influence when you're there and being that visible. So how did I do that? So you see the title, which is Snow White in Matonge. Matonge is actually the neighborhood in Brussels. And the name is coming from a neighborhood in Kinshasa. So Kinshasa is the capital of Congo. It's really like the neighborhood where they go out. And this was a nickname I got in the beginning, Snow White, because I was always there. I didn't fit in. And I looked so innocent amongst all these men. So for instance, one of the reactions I would get if we were going to the city, especially middle-aged white man looking at me like, get out, get out immediately of that roof. What are you doing? So it was the age of my father at that point. So again, how did I do that? Well, and this is what I'm going to talk about today, is the power of otherness. So I was the absolute anomaly in that group. I was so different in every, every characteristic of me was totally different. So, and I exploited that. I just wanted to be the totally different person. And this is quite unusual and this is quite contradictory to what you would read in literature, trying to fit in. I've never tried to fit in. I really exploited the fact that I was something they wouldn't even meet in their daily lives normally. So, and one of the big differences, of course, is that we're all Belgians but I had a Flemish background and they have a Congolese background. So when I was doing my field work in Brussels, I felt farther away from home than when I was, for instance, visiting, in UC visiting UCLA in uh, California, because it was about different food. <laughs> for instance, they would sometimes give me food and I had no idea what it was. And then afterwards they would tell me about it and I would be quite disgusted about what I just ate. But it was also good food. It was also totally different customs, like a really strong role for religion. And these are these um, churches with very intense ceremonies, and I would go to them. It's also about different beliefs, like that's what the cat is about with the witch hat. It's because they would feel, especially Congolese women, were really afraid of cats. And so it happened several times that when I came into an apartment, I was asked, by a maman, which are the really the elderly older women, to chase away a cat because they were so 
afraid of witchcraft. And witchcraft was also something very tangible when I was doing this. So especially we Belgians, we don't believe in witchcraft anymore, let alone chicken divination. Well, so these were all things that I actually met, met during my fieldwork and had to adapt to, to a certain extent. And then, of course, the whole uh, history also between Congo and um, Belgium. But even in my case, there were also language issues. Instead, I'm Dutch speaking, I'm a native Dutch speaker, but Congolese, they speak French. Well, they speak French and Lingala. So my French was not that bad when I started. But even then, I would make really silly mistakes. To give a very embarrassing mistake, and this is where it goes to pure embarrassment, um, is in Brussels, you have the habit of kissing each other. So, I mean, especially for British culture, this might sound very strange, but even boys kiss each other when you just meet. But especially for women, meeting a group of boys, it would be like a ceremony of kissing, kissing me on the cheek to say hello in a decent way. So at some point, I really got fed up with that. I mean, imagine, like every time being kissed by 30 men. So at some point, I said, ne me baisse pas. So you should say, ne me baisse pas, not me baisse pas. Ne me baisse pas means don't fuck me. Ne me baisse pas means don't kiss me. So at that moment, when I said that, the young man in front of me was so embarrassed and everybody started laughing and I was so embarrassed, I would just wish the ground would open up and swallow me. But at that point, it was also this huge icebreaker. I mean, everybody was, yeah, she's from the university, but you know, she says quite silly things. And at some point, they really laughed about it and they were quite happy that I could laugh about it too, although I was completely red and totally embarrassed. So, but sometimes it was also an opportunity when they were explaining gang life to me, it gave me an opportunity sometimes to say like, well, I don't really understand that and blame it on the language, which made that they would actually um, explain it better to me. So at that point, I got more information than someone who would be French speaking God. So and then, of course, there is the shared painful past that Belgium is sharing with Congo. And I mean, especially for the Congolese in Brussels, this is really painful because Brussels has all these buildings which were financed with um, the profit that our King Leopold at that point got uh, from Congo. And especially if you look to dictators these days, you can see him over there. He is one of the dictators throughout history that caused so many deaths. And one of the most um, deaths actually throughout history. And then you can see, for instance, all the buildings over there that are in Brussels and are a continual remembrance for Congolese people to that history, which is painful. And then, of course, I had the role of the colonizer when I was working with them. They had the role of the colonized. And sometimes it was really painful also for me to go to these discussions and really see um, the elderly, especially the women, um, bringing up all these um, memories. And for me as a Belgian, especially a Flemish, to be there um, and always being called like really kind of racist names towards me or to my, to say my ethnic background was painful. But at the same time, I guess because I was a woman, I was not really representing the colonizer to them. It's something, a role that they more assigned to men. So that's how I actually got uh, past that one. And then this one, <laughs> it's like I'm from Leuven, which is a city university. It's quite comparable to Canterbury. So it's a very wide city. It's one of the richest cities also in Belgium. So and this was the image they had for me. The girl with the flower, very naive, something. They definitely, at some point, they felt like they needed to protect me. So one of the instances, for instance, was so I, I moved to Brussels and Brussels has a lovely, like a lovely night scene and very lively. So I was on what they call a nuit blanche, which means a night without sleep. And I was walking through Brussels and suddenly there is like what happens also a lot in Brussels. At some point you get men really asking you, like, oh, let's go to dance. And I was walking through Brussels and then there were three men coming up to me. Oh, don't you want to go and dance with us and this and that. And I was like, no. And I learned that being polite it's more effective than being like, no, let me alone. So I just kept on walking. And at some point I got a telephone. So it was my gatekeeper, which is like this very muscled Congolese guy with dreadlocks. And a gatekeeper means like this was kind of my bodyguard. And he also in the beginning negotiated between me and the group. 
And I still am in contact with him, so he, st he became a kind of brother to a certain extent. And he called me and he was, what are you doing in the middle of the night there running on the street? Like, I just went out. I mean, I didn't do anything. And then so one of the guys started talking. He's like, no, 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 let me alone. He's, who are you talking to? I'm like, yeah, one of the guys here. But I'm not going with him. I'm just going home. I'm going to this place to grab tech. And he was, just stay where you are. And he was, so probably he had seen me. So then we come at a crossroad and these three guys get really kind of aggressive. And I'm like, really saying, leave me alone, this and that. So I turn around. And at that point, they just take off, like run away. And I'm like, wow, I've been really effective in doing this. Um, but well, what's happening was my gatekeeper and his friends just stopped on the crossroad, chasing them away and starting yelling at me, what are you doing here? Like, you could have been raped, you could have been kidnapped, you could have been... And I'm like <laughs> being completely blunt, speechless. And then they're saying to me, like, get in the car, we'll bring you home. And then you have this audience there, because it was quite a scene. Audience wall, again, white students, almost like whispering to me, don't do it, don't get in the car. I really had to ease them down and say, like, look, these are friends of mine. They brought me to my apartment and I got a speech the entire way of how dangerous it was. But at the same time, again, this role gave me this kind of outsider-insider position. They really felt like they should protect me and that they should warn me because I was so naive. And what also helped me, especially in the beginning, <laughs> it's a really strange method, is buying a new car. So I bought a new car and I needed a car quickly. And it was an Alfa Romeo Giulietta, which at that point was really merchandised really well. So I arrived in a brand new car. And before the elderly gang members didn't want to sit with me in the car whenever we were moving around. So when we were moving around with the car, it's because public transport is just way too dangerous for them to take because it passes through different territories in the city. And suddenly, because of my new car, all these elderly men wanted to sit in my car and want to be transported with my car. And just to say that a car is an excellent interview setting because they don't have anything to do and they're having all these kinds of discussions. And I learned a lot about gang life in cars. So how did I do it? If we come to a conclusion. So and this was one of the advices I got from one of my professors in anthropology. And he said, have the courage to be weak. Have the courage to put yourself in a very weak position. And that's exactly what I did. So being, I like to call myself some kind of feminist, and putting yourself in a position that you're overprotected, that indeed, I mean, they would take me to places in the end just to show me off. Like this is a university, white, Flemish, middle class woman, and she is following, following us around wherever we go. And it was quite prestigious, but you really have the feeling at that, at that moment, you have the feeling of being at someone who's like, yeah. In, in French, you would say that that's why soit belle, it means like just shut up and be beautiful. And like that was your role. And then gradually on, I moved to the trusted outsider, someone they would feel really confident to talk about, uh, stuff that they don't feel confident about um, talking with some people of their own um, community, because they knew I was not part of the gossip chain, so I wouldn't tell other people about this. But also some things are really taboo to talk about in a Congolese community. And as I was not part of that, totally not, well, they felt really at ease to talk with me about those things. And they also thought it was amusing because I would have totally different views on things. So, I mean, how did I do it? I just stayed myself. Um, not trying to fit in, but being very comprehensive and a lot of integrity. Just, I was always honest with them when I didn't agree, I didn't agree, although I knew that they would be uh, mad at me at some point. Um, but I knew that in the end, <laughs> they would still like to talk with me. Um, and also, I just was very open. Whenever they start talking to me, I say like, if you are going to confess something to me that I still need to happen, well, then uh, you better not tell me because I will have to go to the police. So, and um, it took a while. And I think one of the biggest things is also I had the time to do this. When I look at my entire ethnographic period, it was about four years, one and a half year, really intense that I moved to Brussels, but really four years that I could still go back and talk to them. So I kept my own identity. Humor is hugely important just really to use it to 
get across boundaries, to get in across the boundary of um, a colonizer versus a colonized, getting across ethnic boundaries, especially in that period there was a bit of, we are not going to say political instability, but at that point the Flemish region was in a kind of fight with the French-speaking uh, region in Belgium. And of course they're French speaking, so they're also part of that. And humor was what helped at that point. Patience, loads of patience. <laughs> In the beginning, I just sat there. I never again got really to talk to them. I just waited for about three, four months for them to come and talk to me. So, and this is actually the biggest thing, well, my biggest uh, strategy of doing this type of research. So what do you see the picture here? It's with my gatekeeper, and this is on my PhD defense. So they just came to my defense as well, which gave a very rare mix of academics, family, all my worlds coming together, and um, the Congolese community or the gang members. In this, uh, in this case, my gatekeeper. What is the downside of this? So what is the hardship about this? It's, it's very emotional. So when I was doing my field work, three of the men of the group that I studied died, uh, two very violently, one because of cancer and of course you in your middle uh, middle class existence you don't know about gang violence and you're certainly not used about having to deal with young men getting stabbed and having to go to funerals um, so it's very emotional and also because it, it's what we call a close to home ethnography i was only living 20 miles away from that well at that point it's like you you never stop with your ethnography. Even these days, when I go back to Belgium, you enter Brussels South, one of the three times I just meet someone or I meet them somewhere in the station because this is one of the places where they hang out. So, and it's very emotional. And it's like, especially for us academics, to experience these emotions of extreme fear sometimes, of extreme sadness, of death and reconcile that with a middle-class existence or with your academic background is really difficult. On the other hand, it is such an experience. It goes beyond your work. It's really a life-changing a life experience. And also in the good sense, like there are parts of Congolese culture that I did take with me. And I mean, there is no party as a Congolese party. So these are also very nice emotions and also the emotion of valorization. And also the emotion that some things are more important than your career. Not saying that I'm not ambitious, but just the idea that sometimes um, some things that we take as very evident or for granted actually in our um, middle class existence are not exactly to be taken for granted. So I hope at some point you will have the opportunity to actually engage in this type of research. Thank you for listening. <laughs>